got a couple fellow citizen scientists on the line, uh, both Nathan and Nick. How are you guys doing today? Doing well, thanks. Doing awesome. And one thing that uh, I've been excited about is, Nathan, you've been very active on social media lately. You have been posting not only a bunch of studies uh, that you've been really delving in deep with lately, but you actually have been teasing out that you have a kind of theory that you want to have a little bit of time to sort of unpack. And uh, certainly, I would love to be able to give you the platform for that, particularly for this series. Uh, because we're very interested in the science behind lipids and particularly how it may relate to atherosclerosis. So you want to just go and kick it off from here? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, I think my recent tweets that I went down the, the line of was looking at how various um, lipid lowering therapies either impacted mortality or coronary heart disease events or didn't. Um, and that was looking at how those interact with the immune system. So as we know from uh, your work and Siobhan's work, uh, and various blog posts and talks that you guys have done, uh, the lipid system is super involved in uh, the immune system. They're all, you know, it, you could say that LDL and lipids and lipoproteins are part of the innate immune system. So I guess it's important to give some background. Um, the immune system is generally split into two branches. You have the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. Uh, the innate immune system is super conserved over hundreds of millions of years. Um, and that senses uh, evolutionarily conserved bacterial components and viral components, generally via a mechanism of these things called toll-like receptors. And those are all over the place. They're expressed on vascular endothelial cells. They're expressed on macrophages. They're expressed all over the place. Um, now, let me, let me actually pause you for a sec, because I do want to catch up those people we may be losing right <laughs> now. Uh, but, but it actually is, I mean, innate versus adaptive is... Uh, very distinctive in that innate are the things we anticipate all the time, right? Yep. So for example, if I were to try to use an analogy, um, pretty much every building on our block, uh, particularly any like commercial building is going to have fire extinguishers because fire is a common problem in buildings all around the world, right? But uh, let's say that your building has a particularly odd and unusual thing that has more to do with uh, something you've learned is a problem just lately in the neighborhood that you're in. So maybe you, you, know, you have a bug infestation that's much more pronounced than you would have thought. You might then go ahead and go to the store and get like some raid and some additional stuff. We would call that adaptive, right? This is you learned in the process of trying to figure out how to deal with this problem what it is that you need to do right now and therefore also be prepared in the future for future bug infestations. That's kind of what you're distinguishing here. Is that right? That is exactly right. And you are the master of analogies on the fly. And that is, that <laughs> is a well perfect done. analogy. Very well done. Uh, and I think that that gives some good background. So the thing that I'll mostly be talking about today and how it relates to uh, lipoproteins and lipids is the innate immune system. Um, however, there are ties between the adaptive immune system, the innate immune system, how that all ties together, et cetera. Um, so kind of in that background, the, uh, the main thing that the innate immune system is looking for, something that's been happening for you know, millions and billions of years is bacterial infections, uh, viral infections, and things like that. So the innate immune system is able to identify um, various components of uh, bacteria. Uh, these can be there's two types of bacteria, two main classes that are based on how we identify them when we do uh, what's called staining. And those can be gram negative or gram positive. And this has to do with whether they have, you know, the type of surface they have. And the gram negative bacteria uh, have little proteins, or I guess it's a, a glycoprotein plus a lipid tail on their surface called uh, lipopolysaccharides. And these can either be released when the bacteria dies or generally as it multiplies, things like that. Uh, and then the gram positive bacteria have uh, another component in their membrane called uh, lipotechoic acid or LTA. So these are LPS and LTA. I'll be talking about those um, a decent bit. And those activate specific toll-like receptors on your cells. So LPS activates toll-like receptor number four and um, LTA activates toll-like receptor number two. And both of those have very similar downstream paths. They cause uh, 
uh, the phosphorylation of something called nuclear factor kappa B, which then goes into the nucleus of the cell and causes it to produce uh, cytokines and chemokines. Uh, uh, cytokines are things like tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF alpha, uh, interleukin alpha and beta, uh, interleukin six and various other things. There's something like 50, 35 interleukins, all kinds of um, other cytokines and chemokines, some of which we probably don't even know about. Let me, let me just, let me interject one thing to do sure. another layperson catch up. Yep. So yes, the reason I think you would agree that a lot of these pathways exist already within our body is because yes, for the uh, hundreds of thousands, millions, possibly billions of years, these large animal systems that are us have been at war with these smaller single cell organisms that are trying to use us in a way that we don't like. And so things like what you were talking about, cytokines, that's, that's a signaling molecule that we act, our cells already have them. They're already spring loaded and ready to go. Kind of like, you know, the fire alarm, how you have to smash the glass and get in. It's already there. It's all, it's all there. You know, the sprinklers uh, that are built into the ceilings, they're all set to go. Why? Because this war has been going on for so long between these two different things, right? And so in that sense, you're, you're detailing in great biochemical, de in great biochemical uh, complexity, all of these things that may seem like an amazing coincidence. They're not a coincidence at all. We were anticipating these attacks to be coming constantly, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's, uh, that's some good background. And that's exactly the case. This is all ready to go and it helps you fight infection. And this is something that you want. You want this response because those cytokines, they're signaling molecules, and they trigger the activation of the immune system. So when you have a cell that sees some bacterial components, it goes, oh no, we need to get the immune system ready. Let's get in some macrophages. Let's get in some neutrophils. Let's get in some T cells and whatever else needs to happen there. I'm not an immunologist, so I don't know. I haven't gone all the way down the, the rabbit hole yet as to what, um, what exactly happens there. But these cytokines trigger an inflammatory response. Um, and that's, that's definitely something we want. I know Siobhan has a talk about, you know, the, the benefits of inflammation and how it's not always kind of uh, the, the devil that we um, kind of portray it to be. We don't want to be, you know, loading up on the curcumin so we're never inflamed. That's not what we want. Um, but yeah, so these, these cytokines are pretty important. Um, and so is the immune response. So uh, I guess... The next bit to look at is uh, how that ties into uh, atherosclerosis. Um, it's generally been seen in the research that something like C-reactive protein, which is also released during an inflammatory response, tends to be an excellent predictor of cardiovascular mortality uh, and all-cause mortality, whereas um, something like LDL tends to be not the greatest predictor as compared to something like C-reactive protein. So that kind of points in the direction of atherosclerosis being uh, at least perhaps not driven by, but very related to the inflammatory state of the body. And if, uh, if you so actually look at this, like every single paper ever in uh, heart disease research will say something like, once the artery wall is damaged, comma, um, that's an incredible, like it's almost every single paper admits that this is like a very common problem and there's very little explanation as to what that upstream mechanism might be. And that's one of the reasons we're interested in this mechanism because it is existence of toxin and the triggering of the immune activation um, in areas that localize around like artery walls and things like that, which could be, this has the potential to help fill in that crucial gap. It's like this large cloud in atherosclerosis research, which I've yet to hear a compelling story behind besides for just saying the word risk factors and then moving on. You know. Yeah, so I guess to give some background into how I went down this rabbit hole, I was talking with Dave and Nick at Low Carb Seattle and Siobhan. Uh, and uh, Dave and Siobhan were talking about the immune system and how Dave felt that potentially um, there was an issue with, there was damage and then the immune system needed to repair it and you essentially never got a chance to repair. Is that an accurate characterization of what you told me? Uh, you know, actually I would, um, so, so let's actually kind of take a step back. I think, I think the one key thing I want everyone to pay attention to in our, our talk right now up to this point is um, what Nick was mentioning a little bit earlier that 
there's a question of whether or not the endothelial cells get damaged. Uh, and to be sure, I have read a lot of these papers. A lot of them don't address whether or not endothelial cells have gotten damaged. There's just sort of the presumption of LDL particles initiating atherosclerosis. Some would say even through means of uh, getting stuck to proteoglycans, which are found underneath, and that perhaps there may not have been a damage event of any kind. Uh, there's, there's definitely lots and lots of different theories that travel around in that regard. But per the talk that I had in Low Carb Seattle, yes, I believe that there could be a problem of either, either I like to put both of them in the same category, damage or dysfunction to the endothelium. Basically, uh, for those people who don't know, the endothelium is the uh, endothelial cells that line your vessel walls. Um, and of course, a target of interest for us is where they are on the arteries, uh, because you don't tend to have atherosclerosis in the veins, for example. Um, and in that respect, we're interested in what not only initiates atherosclerosis, the buildup of plaque behind the arterial wall, but why it progresses. And so to get back to your question, Nathan, um, I believe that we haven't yet ruled out that the progression of atherosclerosis isn't in fact due to not getting to a point where the reparative process can function properly. In other words, I believe that the story of atherosclerosis is mostly about the inhibition of repair. That actually it's the obstruction of the repair that is the larger reason for it. And that in reality, we're dealing with several perhaps millions of atherosclerotic, would be atherosclerotic events all the time because there are all sorts of things that can happen in the course of our vascular system that could potentially be the next you know, thrombosis. The question is, do we actually have the means to address that? So that's kind of a little more of an unpacking of what it was that I was kind of talking about a bit in Seattle uh, and a little bit of what I was chatting about with you. Did, did I leave anything out? No, no, that makes sense. That was uh, definitely uh, what you, you got across to me. Yeah. So that led me to kind of investigate um, what the heck was actually going on there. And I went down a, a rabbit hole of autophagy for a little bit and found some interesting things there. Um, but I don't think that was the whole story because I was still curious about how this damage was happening. So uh, in talking with Nick at Low Carb Seattle, he mentioned a lot about uh, hemodynamics and the localization of the plaques and what's happening there. So if you dig into the research on the hemodynamics side, which is uh, essentially how the blood flows through the, the vessels, um, you find that atherosclerosis develops in very common points, and those tend to be branches, curves, uh, and areas of uh, low, slow, and non-laminar flow, which is a nice uh, <laughs> rhyming triplet there. But uh, if you look at non-laminar flow, laminar flow is when fluids kind of stick together. If you've ever seen one of the fountains at the Bellagio or something where they shoot the water and it stays together in a nice little perfect stream and it all flows in the same direction, that's laminar flow. And if you've turned on the tap and you know put a spoon under it and sprayed water all over yourself, that's non-laminar flow. Um, and I think that the question is, you know, what's happening there? Why is atherosclerosis developing in those areas? And then how do we explain um, these various risk factors that Nick was mentioning? Um, like what, why does diabetes result in higher levels of atherosclerosis? Why do, do autoimmune diseases have higher levels of atherosclerosis? Uh, and cardiovascular mortality. I would say associates um, with not. Yeah, I was about to, I was thinking uh, about this, yeah. to sorry, jump yes. down your throat there. <laughs> sorry, sorry, yes. Why, why are there associations between these things? Um, and I started digging and I found uh, some papers that looked at uh, measuring levels of lipopolysaccharides and other endotoxins in the blood. And we found a really interesting paper that gave uh, a high fat meal to uh, type 2 diabetics uh, and normal controls. And the type 2 diabetics had 70% higher uh, fasting lipopolysaccharides in their serum. And after a meal, they absorbed 336% uh, more uh, after as the area under the curve for the meal. So that looked kind of compelling um, as an interesting hypothesis because the, the kind of hypothesis would be that these circulating like polysaccharides or other endotoxins, uh, which are mostly coming from the gut, would have a greater time to interact with the endothelium in those areas of non-laminar flow in the vessels. 
uh, and that would trigger kind of a, a hyperfocal immune response. One of the things that I like about this hypothesis in particular is that, as, as you were saying, it, it doesn't necessarily require that this process of inflammation is doing the damage. It's totally possible that the process of inflammation and all the very tightly regulated and important subtle mechanisms here are being disrupted by a stimulus that's pushing the system outside of the bounds by which it was designed to operate. That's one of the reasons I like this hypothesis as a compelling model, because it's suggesting that a relatively you know, constant of pressure applied vis-a-vis -vis this mechanism that has probably little evolutionary precedence is disrupting the system. And that can trigger fallout in a number of different ways when it comes to atherogenesis, whether that be direct damage or impaired response or the immune system getting stuck in a certain state where it's not doing the job that it's supposed to. So that's one of the perspectives that I have on this. I like to think of like the black box kind of top down model trying to explain this progression. And the other thing is this large difference, like a, a four fold increase is uh, worth noting as opposed to like a, you know, 12% increase. Um, and especially one of the other things we want to look into is whether someone who's eating a carnivore diet might display an even larger difference of the absorption of these toxins uh, relative to a quote unquote healthy American. If you follow all the horrifying statistics about the average health of, of an American. Let's, let's talk, let's actually unpack the absorption part because that seems like a, a step we want to go slowly over. Yes. So of, of course, what, what you're, what you're referring to is literally, literally the GI tract as a filtration system, right? Which is what yes. we're all using it for. We're, we're consuming, we actually have more surface to the outside on the inside of our body through our GI tract than we do, uh, I think our uh, epithelial cells, right? Like our- yes, outer very outer so You have about uh, 300 square feet of small intestine. Right, it's, it's absolutely preposterous how much room there, but part of that, part of all that surface area is because there's a lot of enterocytes that are lining it whose job it is to basically be the bouncer at the door, right? They're trying to, and even then there's kind of bouncers behind the bouncers, if you will. And I'm, I'm trying to kind of keep it layperson friendly, but that, that process is a very important process because it's supposed to be that a lot of things that aren't going to work inside of your body can get figured out there in that. And so there shouldn't be a lot of bad guys that make it through that filtration process to ultimately end up in your vascular system. Your vascular system is supposed to be at the very end stage of something that was uh, a well-controlled entry point for which almost everything was eliminated. So let me be sure I'm, I'm restating what you're telling me right now. You're saying that there's a difference in this one study between those people who are normal and those people who are type 2 diabetic with what made it through that filtration system in the, in the case of lipopolysaccharides, which comes back to the gram-negative bacteria that you were talking about before. So that suggests a kind of permeability. Am I correct on that? It, it does, yes. Um, so it's worth noting that to your body, your whole gastrointestinal tract is outside of your body. And if you think about it, you're basically just a, a long donut. Um, right. A tiny, tiny hole in the middle. We're all worms. <laughs> yeah. And if you... Uh, if you look at the a cross section, a, sta a muno stained cross section where they, they stain the cell types of a slice of the small intestine, um, there's almost more immune cells than there are uh, enterocytes, uh, which is kind of interesting. So there's there's just all kinds of immune cells just waiting to spring into action, and they do some really nifty stuff, like they kind of stick up periscopes into the gastrointestinal tract and kind of pull stuff in and see if they don't like it or not. Um, and that's called antigen presenting and antigen sampling, and that's kind of cool. Um, but that, by the way, gets gets more to the adaptive immune right. system. It gets really fascinating. If you're ever really bored or not bored, it's actually a very interesting thing to look at. Just how good we are, and I mean, that's you know where a lot of our existing medicine comes in, particularly in the last century. So, yeah. So this the enterocyte lining of your intestine is only a single layer of cells. So there's just a single layer of cells between whatever stuff you put in your mouth and uh, what ends up in your body. And the modern food environment is questionable at best. There's, I believe I found a paper saying there's something like 3000 food additives, um, most of which don't have to appear on labels and are just classified as generally recognized as safe, meaning they aren't like uniquely toxic that we know of. But there's also stuff like uh, gluten, which, which has a breakdown product called gliadin, which causes 
uh, increased permeability in pretty much everybody's um, intestinal tract, not just uh, those with uh, celiac disease. Um, and it's worth noting that um, kind of increasing consumption of refined carbohydrates or processed flour uh, or other acellular carbohydrates can lead to unfavorable growth of bad bacteria in the gut. And then there's other things to add in like the, you know, the gut microbiome research is super in its infancy at this point, but there are a lot of things that seem to influence it, whether you're born via cesarean section or not, um, whether you have pets or not, how much dirt you ate as a kid, um, you know, whether you licked your fingers or whether, how much you wash your hands. There's a lot of um, kind of influencing factors that kind of point to this, that the modern food environment, the modern you know, cleanliness environment ties in with the hygiene hypothesis of all of these things. One of the things I really like about this hypothesis as well is it's kind of separable. You can almost isolate the two halves of it. You think that the, the, the key dysfunction is this one mechanism that is the intestinal permeability and the abnormal behavior. I mean, if you think about it, the digestive system can be like a very calibrated system over evolution and it's used to accepting a certain input and producing a certain output. And if you put things into it, there can be a variety of different things that are going into it that are causing the state of dysfunction or causing it to, to be degraded or operate abnormally. Um, but we can essentially split it and we can say, we can do a test to look at people's serum endotoxin levels as the key dysfunction, assuming we can get an assay that will look into the levels in the serum. And then there's an entirely separate problem of establishing for each of the things on that list, how does it influence the gut health? But we can kind of split it down the middle and uh, test it independently, which is one of the things I like because I, I tend to get very wary of pluricausality and this whole matrix as a cause model. I like the idea that there is a key dysfunction that has the potential to explain a lot of the other observations. Like there are a lot of, and Nathan will get into this, but there are a lot of ways in which this function appears to be upstream of a lot of the other downstream observations uh, in atherogenesis. And the, well, let me, uh, let me ask, let me ask this. Um, can you, can you give me, like we've kind of come at it from behind and sort of the setup. But it, now that you're talking a little more formally about the hypothesis, now just give me the elevator pitch of the hypothesis. What would be the two or three sentence summary of what you're uh, proposing? Uh, you want me to, yeah. So basically the, the whole idea is that we want to explain atherogenesis and we want to explain this dysregulation. And in order to do that, we believe that um, basically the, if you look at uh, atherosclerosis, it clearly has a certain set of characteristics that we need to be able to explain, one of which is damage. And if you think that something in, on the inside of the artery is being damaged, it sounds plausible that the cause of that damage would be something in the blood that shouldn't be there. Um, and so looking for where something might get into the blood, you might start with uh, the intestine, which is kind of where things enter the body. Um, so this, this hypothesis basically posits that things are getting in that shouldn't be getting in, and those are causing dysfunction in a variety of ways. So if you have a toxin like an endotoxin, it can interact with the wall, it can interact with the immune system, um, and it can trigger inflammation and cause a lot of these different problems um, that could potentially explain why this disease starts um, and how it progresses by targeting these receptors, triggering inflammation, um, causing damage in all the different pathways uh, that, uh, I'll see, if, I'll see if I can restate it slightly more simply. Uh, chronically elevated serum endotoxins from potentially multiple sources leads to increased progression and worsening of atherosclerosis and other chronic conditions potentially. So, so would it be fair to say that if there was more widespread uh, testing of the general Western population for things like uh, endotoxicity, for that matter, just directly for things like lipopolysaccharides, that we would probably find a very tight, like your probably good way to test your theory is that we'd probably find a tight correlation uh, between the presence of those elements and atherosclerosis. Yes, and studies do exist on that, and they do have a pretty nice correlation. And this, of course, this is bolstered by, certainly I have read many studies, and I'm glad you brought up C-reactive protein. It's one of the reasons it's one of my favorite uh, markers is C-reactive protein, yes, correlates far, far higher to atherosclerosis than LDL does, right? Uh, and so, yes, I, I'll tell you the two things that I think um, on first glance, me personally hearing this for the first time, that I think um, 
one bolsters and one's a little bit trickier. The one thing that bolsters is a lot of people don't know this, but of those elements that are going into your vascular compartment, as it were, uh, it's first, first order of business is the heart. The heart actually is uh, the first entry point through the, uh, I forget, how, how do you say it, the thoracic duct? Yeah. It's, it, and it's guess where the endotoxins are, they're coming in packaged in chylomicrons. So they're coming in right from uh, the bile there and the, or the, uh, the uh, lymph system there. Potentially, yes. And so, and so in that regard, uh, there is more potential for a problem where you're talking about the hemodynamics that could help to sort of make the case to some extent. Where this, the other part that it gets a little bit tricky and where I think you need the second part of what uh, Nick was explaining on just the higher presence of uh, constant endotoxicity or for that matter, just an overall more chronic immune response is I don't think that the story is clear that once the initiation of atherosclerosis appears that it will necessarily um, increase at a site specific area in a clear dose dependent fashion. Um, and so in that sense, it's not like, it's not like a seed that you're planting and then it kind of grows on its own in a very predictable way. Uh, so there clearly is more to the story on what the, uh, at least for me, there's clearly more to the story on what the nature of the environment is in your body on a regular basis that can help to, uh, further progress that atherosclerosis or for that matter, uh, halt it or potentially regress it. Yeah, so there's certainly, you know, an active progression, regression kind of process with reverse cholesterol transport and macrophages coming and going with uh, things like that. So I think that's, uh, maybe you could expand on that, uh, like what, what this theory wouldn't answer for you there. Because I guess you would also potentially see changes in hemodynamics when the plaque develops. So sometimes you can have plaques where they kind of push the artery out and you don't see a narrowing of the lumen, or you can have plaques that kind of grow in and that would result in changes in the hemodynamics that could maybe, maybe the hemodynamics are no longer exposing that area to as much um, of the endotoxin and it kind of shifts to another area and that right. plaque can regress while the other plaque is. You're talking about growing. stenosis and, and how it's, you know, narrowing the lumen and so forth. I'm, I'm actually very obsessed right now with uh, uh, hemostasis because uh, I'm, I'm sort of learning a lot of things from a very different direction, but I really wanted to get to particularly where regeneration, the true regeneration can occur and under what circumstances. And hemostasis, there's actually a primary and a secondary. And sure enough, they're very different as, as far as how fast something happens and then gets resolved. And primary hemostasis is happening constantly, constantly. Secondary hemostasis is happening also very constantly. But if you didn't have things like plasminogen uh, that came in for the reparative process, you would have millions of clots around your vascular walls throughout your body. So there, there, again, this is why I constantly think there are many, I guess you could say, potential opportunities uh, for atherosclerosis to develop. The question is, what is it that keeps it in a constant state of progression? That's certainly something that I'm very interested in, which is why I'm interested in what is you have for your theory here. Dave, have you seen the, um, the Constantine Bellican in his book? I don't know if, if Nathan, and we, we keep tweeting out pages from it, but basically there's a whole... And, and this is one of the things, like, I don't mean to imply that atherosclerosis is, like, simple in any way. You know, I think that things can be complicated and maybe the model of how we, we approach understanding them can be a little bit simplified, like if we have a, a hypothetical cause. But there are, I believe, like, six different types of lesions. And he actually has them grouped by, like, key dysfunctions, like abnormal coagulation, abnormal perme permeation, and abnormal proliferation. There, there's clearly a lot going on here. And there's such incredible nuance to the progression and a lot of even steps within the transformation between these different types of plaques that are incredibly poorly understood. That's why we've looked into data along like the uh, bacterial components or like the C pneumonia bacteria that have been imaged inside these plaques and other things. Yeah, it's worth noting that there are bacterial lipids, LPS, and actual bacteria found inside of atherosclerotic plaques. So that's kind of another uh, interesting thing to note. This is and, quite a rabbit hole to, to say. Yeah, it's, 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 it's and, and let me actually, clear. sure. No, and let me actually add, um, as Siobhan would point out, uh, that she told me about a while ago, I didn't actually realize when they also stain for LP little a, specifically APO little a, they tend to find that that's part of like the fibrous content and so forth. And if they were, if they were staining more for that, because if they don't stain for it, they don't know about the presence of that, of those crinkles. 
we don't really know, you know, just how much it is. But here's the thing: you don't find LP little a in healthy tissues. You don't. It, it, this is, and this is, and here's the issue: I think that there's going to be a lot of complexity in the process of uh, resolving an atherosclerotic plaque for a good reason. And this is where I'm just kind of going to typical engineering mindset. You have a kind of fog of war situation. You, you have a triage of what, you know, you might think of as a hospital that's overwhelmed by a catastrophe. And the worse the catastrophe, the more there's going to be chaos within the hospital, right? And so there's, there's a point where things can kind of settle, become a little more orderly. But then once you're actually asking the body to regenerate tissue in a meaningful way, you're really asking for a lot of order. And so there's going to be a process. There's kind of this interstitial part where you're actually still trying to sort things to a point where you can reconstruct. And, and I think that that is going to just look very different from one plaque to the next in many different respects. It's not going to have a clear composition because it depends on the nature of what actually caused the plaque in the first place, which basically to kind of put, you know, my own two cents in, I think that there's really a lot of things that can initiate uh, atherosclerosis. I think there's actually a fairly long list, but I think there's a short list on what resolves atherosclerosis. I mean, that's, yeah, I, I'm not a fan of the the long list of causative factors. I think that that uh, a lot of them can be explained by um, how those interact with, for example, uh, gut permeability or things like that. Like smoking increases intestinal permeability, alcohol increases intestinal permeability. People with autoimmune diseases have chronic inflammation potentially related to uh, intestinal permeability. Uh, the risk of myocardial infarction is drastically increased by 10 to 17 times when you have an infection or um, influenza or respiratory infection. Uh, and all of that is kind of explained by the bacterial components triggering uh, plaque growth. And, and again, that doesn't, necessarily, that doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't a lot of different mechanisms like starting from the inflammation and working towards damage to the tissue or... Because, I mean, if you read Malcolm Kendrick, I'm, I'm still not even sure. Like, if you look at, uh, like, early fibrous lesions, they have basically fibrin and little tiny scabs that are, like, deep inside the artery wall. And it's like, well, how'd that get there? And it's clear that there are many different pathways. And you look at the proliferation and the potential routes for damage to the tissue, like the endothelium, the coagulation, endothelial progenitor cells, all these different processes that are kind of attempting to, to fix the problem. Um, there's a lot going on there. No, but I think, I think Nathan's points will take in. Basically, in, in his answer to me saying there's kind of a, a list of things that can initiate it, you're basically saying, actually, you can go a step before that, Dave, and look at what it is that was the gateway for all those things, right? Would that be exactly. a fair restatement? Yes. So, in effect, I mean, it really, truly, this would be very monumental if true that this ultimately just comes down to gateway keeping. And that it's the permeability that will stay, that will really designate a lot of not only the capability for the beginning of atherosclerosis, but do you su suspect if people uh, were able to figure out how to resolve that best, that it would also help in the potential uh, resolving or perhaps even regression of atherosclerosis? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of the things that I found about reverse cholesterol transport of the immune system, a lot of it was regulated by autophagy. So I think if you were to remove the chronic stimulus or uh, reduce the acute stimulus. Like I think it, it's not necessarily just um, intestinal permeability. That's probably the case in kind of the bulk Western environment. But I think if you had chronic infection uh, or just general, you know, immune susceptibility, um, you would have increased risk of atherosclerosis just due to those infections, not necessarily just uh, intestinal permeability, but other sources of these bacterial endotoxins. For example, uh, people with periodontitis have a huge increased risk of um, atherosclerosis, and that would be uh, oral microbiome or chronic tooth infection or something leading to uh, the production of the bacterial endotoxins. In short, this theory is kind of simple enough that we should be able to rule it out. You know, we should be able to do some relatively simple tests to see if we're on the right path. And if, I mean, we, we can make predictions about what we expect LPS to do and what those associations are. And it, you know, I, I would expect strong correlation between these endpoints. I think it's worth ruling out, especially because you know, Occam's razor, if it's a simple hypothesis, you may as well test it. You know, if it fits, it fits. And a lot of the research we're digging into seems to suggest that everything seems to fall into place. Like we're, we're still trying to look for, I mean, people like you, Dave, to 
tell us where this doesn't make sense. And we're definitely interested to hear all that. Um, but it, it seems compelling and it seems simple. And I, I like the hypothesis for that reason. Well, I do, I do want to tell you one challenge I think you'll run into, which is, of course, the reason I love to do high frequency testing is so that I can, I can gather a succession of tests to get a sense of it. So, for example, um, I may try... <laughs> I already have such a suite of things I already take with my blood work. I have to be careful now because of the total volume taken out. It's going to become its own confounder. Um, so serious issue, right? So, yeah. uh, but one of the things I'll see if I can add is at least an occasional uh, testing of things like lipopolysaccharides, because even if it turns out that I have low levels, I want to see if there's some consistency with the lowness of the levels. The reason is, is because we want to be able to start having um, some comparisons of high frequency testing to at least get some sense if, uh, even if I turn out to be a healthy subject or for that matter, if I turn out not to be a healthy subject, is it generally consistent as to what the presence of it is? Because the one difficulty, the one difficult thing about testing your hypothesis is if it turns out that the endotoxin levels are elevated a certain degree, but the immune system has had enough of a, of a go at it that it's dropped it down for like a couple of weeks and it's up a couple of weeks or something along those lines, things we couldn't have even thought about until we had the ability to actually see this in a succession and see what the uh, standard deviation is, right, between different tests. And that's, that I think is gonna be part of the challenge. It's, it's my also, assist, oh, go for it, Nick. Yeah, we, uh, it's also quite possible that this is a postprandial phenomenon and that the fasting values may not be as insightful as we would hope them to be. Like, I, I can't, it, it's clear that the uh, net absorption of endotoxins in diabetics is substantially elevated uh, in the postprandial time space. So like, is a fasting measurement going to be useful? I, I can't answer that question. There's also we, multiple, speaking of the postprandial phenomenon, somebody pointed me to a bunch of papers from a while ago that were questioning whether atherosclerosis is a postprandial phenomenon. So I think, that's very, <laughs> I think that's very possible, by the way. I even, I even have a term that I've been using recently because I, it, this, you know, not to go too far down this rabbit hole, but this is certainly something that I've postulated for a while uh, that things like, for example, excessive cheating, I even have a term for it that I'm calling binge as in a binging injury that perhaps at periods of time where people are going nuts and they're just like, well, I'm going off my diet for the weekend and I'm going to take advantage of it. That uh, I've certainly experienced, I've known other people that have experienced different things that can happen during that period that you maybe more inclined to ignore because you're in kind of a high, but you really are putting enormous stress on your system in a ways that it may not have anticipated given uh, particularly how it was that your lifestyle and diet was before that point. And, and so this is one of the issues is that I, I do think if, you're, if you yourself are actually creating shocks to the system, especially in things like hemodynamics, right? Um, that's, that's something you'd be mindful of. And the thing is, I think we all, I think we all internally don't want that to be true. We want to think that we could just, you know, completely cheat one day, even if we're on a ketogenic diet. You know, today I'm going to, I'm really going to go nuts on pancakes and syrup and, you know, have, have all the joy that I want. But I think there really is the possibility that you could have a postprandial injury that's very substantial based on what it was you consumed. I think the, that's one of the reasons when I, when I talk about nutrition in general, that I, I really dislike the moderation paradigm. Um, one, it just simply doesn't explain, like the whole idea of like the, the way public health approaches nutrition doesn't explain the observations in terms of like the population burden of disease. I think that a toxic environment model and a toxic food model makes more sense. And I think it's much easier to explain dietary choices, at least the, the way that I view them is, you know, this food is toxic, don't eat it. And that, that you know, I, having experienced the carb creep and, you know, gained 40 pounds and well-versed in like the dangers and how you can go down the rabbit hole of cheating. And I, I think ex explaining to people that like the key here is avoiding the toxic food, but that is the element that we care about. And that's the thing that we're hypothesizing is, is going to bring you the biggest ROI, at least from a nutritional perspective. No, I think your point's well taken. I mean, the, the issue is we still are far away from understanding what the real effects are in those circumstances. So when you have a study like you were talking about right now with diabetics getting a fat load, that gives us a small glimpse, but it may be an important one. So no, per what we were talking about just a little bit earlier, I think it may be that the postprandial test may actually be one of your best tests to rule this hypothesis out, is 
depending on how fast gut permeability can heal, at least with regard to your hypothesis, if you could have some expectation that it's relatively not too changeable, uh, you know, day to day, then a postprandial test seems like a good way to um, direct intervention testing. Yeah, we essentially want to reproduce that study's, um, you know, idea of how they tested that with, you know, a heavy cream bolus or something to essentially a fat tolerance test with, you know, Nick and I as carnivores and we'll find someone, a less healthy friend uh, to load up on some heavy cream and we can do an ELISA test for uh, lipopolysaccharides or lipotechoic acid and see if, if there's a, you know, massive difference in postprandial response. Because we're also curious of like to see a big response as nick mentioned like a 12 percent change isn't worth talking about like we want to see like a 5x difference or something like that's that's meaningful we're, we're kind of also curious about the model here like obviously a heavy cream bolus is like a ketogenic ish meal whereas like the question is you know what is the characteristic of the intestinal permeability does it get degraded over time how quickly does it heal and so like there's the possibility that um, I mean, we're kind of expecting to see that people who have a healthier gut just absorb much less endotoxin with this meal. But there's also the possibility that like differing meals would trigger differing responses too. So that's something else we possibly want to look into, maybe adding some amount of carbohydrate to the meal or other things like that to try and see how the response changes. Because in reality, people aren't drinking heavy cream every day. So that's not necessarily representative of the internal environment from a life of well, I can tell Well, I can tell you what I would want to do. So sure. I, what I'd want to do, and I'm, I'm not willing to do this myself because I've already done enough carb cycling in the last year. Uh, but let's say that we're doing it right now. I'd actually uh, revert back to a mixed diet. And I, me being me, I would probably try to see if I could make it the same every single day. And then uh, I would do a test uh, a week before the uh, intervention phase and then at the final day of the intervention phase. So I had a comparison between the two of what the endotoxin load is, but I would do it in a challenge meal that would include the uh, cream, but it would also still be a mixed meal. So I would actually have both. It would be a fasted uh, test. It would be the first meal that I had of that day. Then I'd switch over to a ketogenic diet and go on that for some amount of time, maybe four weeks or six weeks, and then repeat the same thing, but the mixed meal only happens in the week before the end of the experiment, and on the final morning of the experiment, and then actually see if that same mixed meal in the different context made a difference. Yeah. That's at least what I would have thought of, yeah. because I, because in particular, we want, to, we want to rule out that it's the meal itself. We want to rule out uh, other conditions if possible. And then uh, while it may not be the ketogenic diet in particular, it could be that things that I did in the course of being on the ketogenic diet uh, may have helped in, uh, you know, helping out the uh, bouncers a little bit better, as it were, uh, for the gatekeeping. That's possible. I think a, a crossover design like that would be pretty awesome to control for a lot of these things. I mean, it just depends upon, I mean, I guess we're, we're probably operating under the assumption that, that this is variable in some reasonable amount of time, like weeks, which I think is probably pretty reasonable, especially if people have gone carb binging and gained weight. You know, it, it happens quickly. It doesn't, these, these parameters seem to go to hell in a, in a not, not, long period of time. I can speak to that. I have, I have, this is seriously the reason why last year kind of put me on a bad path that I wanted to correct for this year and focus more on my health is even though they were controlled experiments. I mean, it, it's kind of funny when you basically are doing experiments that are supposed to be uh, like, oh, hey, now is your chance to cheat. Uh, in a controlled experimental way, you're actually aiding the science. That makes it worse because a lot of those cases uh, I had an aftermath effect. In fact, uh, Siobhan will tell you about one she's having right now. She had done her carb version. Uh, and like me, with the, the very worst one that I ever had was just a four-day intervention experiment with added sugar, added dextrose, which happened back in January. And afterwards, it really put me off kilter for a while. And it's why I now have such a new profound respect uh, for how dangerous it may really turn out to be to go off diet or for that matter to be adding in uh, more sugar more any kinds of cheats of some kind and what effect that uh, what lasting effect that has because the one advantage we have in doing these end of one experiments is that we're in control of when the start point is most of the time people go off of their diets there's some catalyst event like they're visiting family 
or they have some hard deadlines that are making them pull all, you know, one nighters and so forth. And so and they they're, they're also stressed. Right. And so they associate and, uh, those environmental issues with why they're having such a tough time after trying to get back on the, on the uh, wagon. And, and it's and a I, double I, whammy because stress also increases intestinal permeability. So that's no fun. Right. <laughs> right. The hard part about this, the hard part about this, I mean, like I know from my experience on keto, I've been doing it for five years. I kind of lost my way in the middle. It, it has nothing to do with the diet itself. It's all about those external factors, the addiction, all these things going on, managing social environments and things like that. That's been my experience. Um, it took me like, I, it took me a while. I, I didn't even realize how addicted I was at the time, but there was about six months where I, like my cheating had increased kind of monotonically. And I think probably a dozen or more times I was like, today's the day I'm going to stop cheating. And then the cheat came along and I, I cheated. And that, to this point, I basically, I have to be very, very careful if I opt to cheat. It's just far easier for me and reduces my level of anxiety and all these apprehension I have over eating. You know, the, the thing that I really like about the ketogenic model in general is that I don't have to be hungry and I don't have to have anxiety about eating because I spent about a decade with that mindset, which was kind of, I have a whole nother you know, set of thoughts on the whole paradigm of calorie counting and how that affects your mental state. Um, especially when it's indoctrinated into people as like a, a child. But I think you have to be very careful with it and understand that, I don't know, th th there's a lot more. I think Low Carb Seattle, they've talked a lot more about this food addiction and all these other parameters that I think are not discussed enough in this, in this uh, community because it's really, no, I agree. really hard. It's not simple. I look, for what it's worth, I, I feel like <laughs> I'm working on the book right now for Cholesterol Code. I feel like I could write a whole other book from what I've learned from these experiments, especially on my own struggles with food, I was not aware I had. Like there, there are a number of things for which um, the experiments helped me to exert self-control. And a lot of people, including my family, uh, think that I'm much more disciplined than I actually am. Um, and I've learned strategies to get in and around that, uh, but, the, but they were learned strategies. That's, that's what I think a lot of people don't get is a lot of people feel like, wait, I know, you know this guy or that guy, and they seem to just will themselves towards a better diet and a better lifestyle and so forth. But from a philosophical standpoint, um, I thought that too until I was doing these experiments. These experiments helped to show in this very controlled manner how much these changes in my diet actually affect my ongoing, um, my ongoing behavior. And even things like my general mood and outlook way more than I thought that they would like, of course, I wouldn't be that surprised if I felt a little more like how I remembered feeling before keto when I was doing a carb swap experiment. Uh, but one of the most profound moments I ever had, I want to say it was like maybe a couple years ago was I was doing a carb swap experiment virtually no differences in my mood at all, except for the very last day, all of a sudden my mood completely dropped off while I was just in the middle of writing a spreadsheet. And in 60 seconds, I not only felt really bad, I felt really tired and had just a lot of pessimism out of nowhere towards all these different things in my life. And when I was describing this to other people who've done well on keto, where it's like improved their mood and so forth, they were like, yeah, you went, you went where I was before I'd gone on a low carb diet. Wow. And this is to say the low carb diet is a panacea. Uh, this is just to say that there was some degree, I suspect, of hormonal regulation or something that makes sense as to why that click happened because that lasted about 24 hours for me. And again, I didn't have a catalyst. I didn't have like a whole bunch of other stressors around me that I could blame it on instead. I was doing one of the most boring things I could imagine and I was nearly done with the experiment. I, I wasn't even, it didn't even matter what happened next. And so I, anyway, a little bit of an aside, but uh, maybe yeah. someday we'll do like a big, you know, broadcast, the three of us just talking about that because that's a very deep subject and certainly one I'm very interested in. Jordan yeah, Peterson talks about that, about the mood in particular with his, uh, what did he say? He, he had some like apple cider or maybe some wine or something and it caused him like multiple weeks of a feeling of doom, just brought all those things back that had somehow resolved on a carnivorous diet. It just highlights the level to which we really don't understand what's going on here, in my opinion. Well, yeah, I'm it's, super it's, curious how much is modulated by the gut microbiome. Like, I, I'm looking forward to seeing Siobhan's results from her post-diet biome test to see how much of a shift there was in her microbiome. Because we know that depression, for example, is very closely tied to inflammation as well. And uh, how effective certain antidepressants are uh, actually depends on your, you know, they can judge the effectiveness. If you have a high C-reactive protein, some drugs will work. If you have a low C-reactive protein, some other drugs will work. And it's possible that the main mechanism of, for example, SSRIs is actually inflammation. 
we, we should caveat though that um, all these microbiome tests are done with fecal samples which come from the yes. large intestine uh, and that that is not necessarily representative of the true environment of what's going on here in the small intestine. We talked about it with Gabor a lot because he's into this. A lot of the studies that we have um, on small intestine are rodent studies and things like right. that. There are a very limited number of studies looking and it's clear that he basically made the point that the volume of the large intestine is larger, but the surface area absolutely pales in comparison to what's going on in the small intestine. And there's very little we, data. We also don't even know if the fecal microbiome matches the colonic microbiome, and it doesn't really seem to. But uh, before getting off, before getting off that, I really should point out that that's another example of where the causal relationship is often assumed. It's assumed because you're depressed, your immune system is is failing. And this isn't to say that that's not possible. Absolutely, we can we can see the stressors inducing a difference in the immune system. But we can't, I mean, can we really rule out that things like gut permeability actually may have an impact on your mood from that causal direction? I don't know that we can, right? It's all maker versus marker problems. It's like turtles all the way down, you know what I mean? Every single thing in medicine is another example of a maker versus marker problem as soon as you see that association, you know? So it's time for me to play devil's advocate. Certainly, there are a lot of people uh, that I know personally who right now would say, okay, this is a great thing that you guys are talking about, but we all know what is one of the chief risk factors for atherosclerosis, which I know you guys know pretty well, and that's LDL particles themselves, low-density lipoproteins. And in fact, if you go on a diet like the low-carb diet, but the net result is that you're seeing an increase in your LDL particles, well, that's another way by which your uh, endothelial cells could be damaged and that we could be progressing atherosclerosis. My Lord. <laughs> the, yeah, I mean, we, we talked about this a lot. Like I went over my entire thesis of why I disagree with that. I mean, part of my problem is that it's clear, like I was just noticing this yesterday. If your hypothesis is that the concentration of lipoproteins drives a disease, where is the graph showing you over time, what the concentration of lipoproteins in the, in the tissue look like. Because as far as I understand, I've never been presented with that graph. And I know from observations that there is not a producer product relationship in the tissue from the accumulation of, of like the concentration of lipoproteins versus the disease progression. There's plenty of early lesions with no lipid accumulation. And it's not clear that there's like a, you know, the lesions can progress without the existence of lipoproteins. It, it I mean, and Nathan was saying earlier today, even that there's is a difference between the esterification of the cholesterol in a uh, like a complicated lesion versus an earlier lesion. But which paper was that you were referencing? Yeah, I found a paper that was actually looking at the cholesterol content of erythrocytes, red blood cells, um, because they said that in complicated plaques, there's some percentage of the cholesterol is free cholesterol, and that doesn't come from LDL because LDL carries esterified cholesterol um, or cholesterol ester. Um, so the question is, how does that red blood cell cholesterol end up in the lesion? Um, it's also the case that if you look at pathology textbooks, they'll say that lesion progression begins with vascular smooth muscle cell dedifferentiation. Um, and if you look at what causes that dedifferentiation, uh, tends to be cytokines. Atherosclerosis is fundamentally a proliferative disease, not, not a disease of abnormal yeah. accumulation. And that's, it's actually kind of terrifying to me how, how, poorly a lot of these um, papers seem to grasp the actual basic pathology of the disease, the steps and the procedure and, and how A leads to B, because there's so much going on here that's, I mean, so, I don't know, it's very difficult because one of the things that really bothers me is there isn't per se an, an hypothesis of how lipoprotein levels drive atherogenesis, it's just somehow by whatever means necessary it drives the disease. So at each point, you know, it really bothers me that there's so little data on this, you know, how does the LDL cross the endothelium? Why does it cross the endothelium? Is this a diffusion driven disease? Is this a disease driven by transcytosis? There's, there's just very little. I actually have a, uh, a ship uh, analogy for this that I hope Dave will appreciate, which is that uh, <laughs> if, you, if you assume, since we like talking about these things as ships, if we think of the, the hull of the ship as uh, the endothelium, essentially what all of these papers describe is uh, leaky hull syndrome. So uh, the hull just leaks, like we have leaky, that's not a useful thing. We don't just, we have leaky hull syndrome and what drives it? Oh, there was too much water. Um, and that, that's not a compelling 
hypothesis that just doesn't. Well, I think, I, I think what, what the critics would say is they would say, look, if you look at existing diseases, especially um, those, for example, who have hypobeta lipoproteinemia or a beta lipoproteinemia, which means that they have nearly no LDL particles, they get no cardiovascular disease. I mean, there's just, it's non-existent. Whereas you go to the other end of the spectrum, you see familial hypercholesterolemia, especially the classic kind where there's uh, mutated LDL receptors, uh, especially if they have homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, so super crazy high levels of LDL, uh, they tend to show very fast and progressing atherosclerosis. You have, you know, like say a 10 year old child potentially dying of, um, of a cardiovascular um, event, right? My understanding though is that the pathology of familial hypercholesterolemia and homozygous, it's not the same lesion type that you see in a mature complicated plaque in a human. It's the similar, they're the same plaques that you get when you feed a rabbit cholesterol in the aorta. They're like fatty streak type lesions. They're, it's not, the people are very, uh, I, I'm, I'm interested to hear that first data point and, and look more into that because that's curious or interesting. Although, to me, but... I mean, we, we understand, and I, I'm not going to deny that lipoproteins are involved in atherosclerosis. Um, it's just a question of does the concentration drive the disease? And I think based for, for on me, the available data, we can pretty much say no. For me, the, the biggest data point is uh, the four-year trial. You know, if, if you use a drug or not, you know, a lipid-lowering therapy to get the LDL down to 30 and you don't see all-cause mortality bump at all, um, that I mean, I, I would operate under the assumption that if the disease stops and the, the, the trigger of the disease stops, that uh, we will see a drop off in death relatively quickly as the body starts to fix the problem. Because if we're hypothesizing, I mean, there are no real examples that I can think of of a disease where like if the cause is removed and the disease is allowed to, to heal, that it just kind of goes on indefinitely. It's kind of an ad hoc hypothesis that they make that we shouldn't expect to see an improvement to mortality if we reduce the risk factors, you know? and my assumption when I see that data or the way I interpret it when you lower LDL to 30 is that that kind of bounds the maximum significance of LDL on this disease progression. Because if LDL were very important and you dropped it down to 30 for two and a half years, I would expect to see a rather stark improvement in mortality, you know? And that, that's one of those data points that I just can't, I can't understand how you rationalize because I simply don't agree with that ad hoc hypothesis that we shouldn't expect to see an improvement if the disease stops or slows, you know? Uh, yeah, I think, and what I think that they, so first of all, I'll just say right now, I know already they would be kind of jumping on the all-cause mortality. Uh, I know this because of course, I'm a big fan of all-cause mortality. Uh, what they would say is, well, a lot of these drug trials, they're very short. And because they're very short, we can really only answer the question of one kind of mortality, and that's the one they're focused on, which is, uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease mortality. And only in that case can we really get a strong answer. And the answer seems to be it has some effect and therefore it has some effect and it's a good enough reason to move forward on the therapy. The, the problem is that there's, there's such hypothesis flexibility here because like, what is your hypothesis? My, like, if, if you explained this to someone, they would conclude that the hypothesis is that like Elevated fat in the diet leads to elevated serum cholesterol, particularly LDL, leads to death from heart disease. And conversely, a reduction in serum cholesterol via whatever means necessary will lead to a reduction in death vis-a-vis -a, -vis a reduction in heart disease death. You know, it's excluding the all-cause mortality metric is not intuitive to people. That's not what people would assume when you say a, an intervention produces success. You know what I mean? Like, that's one of the things that really bothers me is people, it's that whole like non-intuitive section of like non-cardiac harm based upon an intervention, like the, the idea that there can be, when people understand this hypothesis intuitively, they're making the assumption that they're synonymous and that we're not doing unintended harm, right? And that therefore all cause mortality is basically a proxy for the benefit. And they should be basically linked. Like if you see a benefit in, in cardiovascular disease, you should see a benefit in all cause mortality one to one, you know? I, I, we also have other studies that like CTAP inhibitors that lower LDL, raise HDL and had no benefit and they'll, the lipidologist crowd will admit that readily. Um, and I don't know what they would say. They would say that was a failed drug though, that that was a failed right. all the I, I can actually I feel like all the individual lipoproteins were engaging in some conspiracy against you know, <laughs> LDL fans. I won't call them out by name, but I, it's just like, that doesn't, I don't know. It, it, you have to be able to approach this as a black box and 
look at the problem and you should be able to make predictions and see those predictions come to fruition. And if your model can't explain, I mean, that basically says to me that the, the hypothesis is insufficient to explain the available observations and that we need a better hypothesis. That's the conclusion that you draw when you make a prediction and, and it you know, doesn't bear out in a simple experiment. And although we didn't talk about this, uh, how LDL and LPS and all of these things are related, I guess we could talk about how that can explain some of these drugs. So uh, your body to clear these like polysaccharides from circulation, they're actually bound to something called LPS binding protein. Great name, gives you real information. Um, and that is associated with the concentration of ApoB containing lipoproteins. So in studies, if you do tracer hold studies- it. Hold oh, it, hold it. All right. I don't want anyone to miss what you just said because it may be one of the All most right. relevant things you've said <laughs> in the podcast. Don't just say ApoB containing lipoproteins. What do you mean by that? Uh, LDL. <laughs> and and the, the HDL is involved as well, but LDL is involved in the clearance. Um, so when you, LDL you the, is involved in the clearance of binding to lipopolysaccharides, is that right? Correct. One and of the they are that transferred you, from L HDL to LDL to be cleared by the liver. One of the things that Nadir pointed out when we had a chat with him was that the lipoprotein system is incredibly highly evolutionarily conserved, um, which means it's very important. If it wasn't important, it would probably have gone away if its primary function was to lead to atherogenesis. That makes sense. And it, so it's clear that I mean, these things exist for a reason. The liver is not just synthesizing these and shuttling them around with transcytosis and all these different receptors. It, it's clear that there's uh, a purpose here and, and seeing it tie into the immune system and to clearance of these things is rather interesting to us. Yeah, so HDL has the highest binding capacity for lipopolysaccharides and they're actually integrated into the phospholipid, uh, not a bilayer, just the phosph phospholipid shell of HDL. And then they're transferred to LDL via phospholipid transfer protein, which is PLTP. Um, and it also looks like uh, CTEP, cholesterol ester transfer protein, is also involved. Um, but the actual clearance of uh, lipopolysaccharides and lipochicoic acid is via LDL and the liver. Um, now let me, let me, sorry, sorry to interrupt you one more time, because this is, this is an important thing for people to think about physically. So HDL particles are small, right? And there's actually a lot more HDL particles by far than LDL particles. Two orders of magnitude more. Yes, correct. As in there's a thousand roughly HDL particles for every LDL particle under normal circumstances, right? The LDL particles though are very large relative to the HDL as far as they're a bigger boat. And in fact, as per what you talked about with both the LPL and the CETP, uh, what we're talking about, I'm sorry, um, TP, PLTP. Uh, PLTP, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about an active transference, as in HDL's collecting stuff and is transferring it onto LDL. Now, why would it do that? Why would HDL take stuff that's out there and then put it onto LDL? Uh, probably because LDL is going to go back to the liver and allow right. uh, things to be regenerated. Um, and that's kind of interesting because I found a paper which showed that it's at the clearance of LPS is actually modulated by the concentration of LDL. So as you add LDL to uh, lipoprotein free serum, you actually see like a, a nice kind of uh, increase until you reach a maximal concentration uh, of clearance. So that's super interesting. Interestingly, this does not come from heart disease research, right? It comes from sepsis yeah, research? Yeah, almost all of this comes from uh, immunology and sepsis research. So sepsis is kind of the super acute phase of endotoxemia. So if a leaky gut or intestinal permeability leads to kind of low chronic levels, sepsis is the levels of you're going to die um, because your immune system is just... It's overloaded, right. Super, it's overloaded. Um, it's so the, that's kind of an interesting... Yeah, it's the high DEF CON state of your body. That's that's where things are very serious, like life threatening. You're you're at the edge of death. But but I want to I want to also point out something else you mentioned that's super important for people to realize. A lot of the research you're talking about are coming is coming from the field of immunology. It should be coming from the field of lipidology, but it's not. It's primarily coming from lipidology. In fact, one of the first. Well, I, I don't I don't even think it's coming from immunology. Really, there's very little. There are tiny little bits of research on immunology and lipoproteins, but a lot of it is sepsis research. For example, like as a way to treat sepsis, they've thought about 
injecting more LDL to clean up the endotoxins. Right. And, and this is, I mean, again, odds are who's ever watching this, you've never heard anything like this before. And I myself didn't hear anything like this until three years ago when I was first broaching this, uh, really almost four years ago. When I first came across a paper of an immunologist who was arguing that this should actually be part of existing textbooks, the, the lipoprotein immune response. And uh, in reading some commentary coming back at them, they were arguing against it, that it may give mixed signals. And I, I was stunned by that, but that was like kind of the opening understanding of why it is that there really is um, a lot less emphasis paid towards the immune response of lipoproteins, which I really cannot emphasize enough as not only very important to me, it's important to Siobhan, it's important to you guys, because it's a very big deal when it comes to being able to fight back. Uh, these problems that we know are part of the innate immune system's um, attempt to resolve. I think we're very concerned about the, I mean, we're just looking for high quality research to understand basic facts about this. And, and it's very weak. It's, there's not a lot of good data. People are not looking into this sufficiently in, in ways that are really disconcerting to us. I know that like even you try to find a single pathologist who's done autopsies and looked at what's going on inside a, a complicated plaque. Most of them are dead from what I understand. There are very few currently still practicing and we're still trying to connect with them. But a, a lot of this research is not being done and a lot of the things that we're most interested in haven't been investigated in terms of exactly where this cholesterol is and what it's doing and how it ties into the immune system and all these little, little pieces that are incredibly critical to understanding this progression. Well, something that I've said myself before, and this isn't necessarily tie into your theory, but it's, it's probably one of the most controversial things I've discussed. I've talked about on Dr. Drew's show and a whole bunch of other places, but basically, I believe that the reason you're going to find things like that in atherosclerotic plaques is because I believe endothelial cells are taking part in the immune response. That oh, they certainly sounds, are. I think that that's been shown. They express toll-like receptors and they're the they, first they line of defense. They have 36 they have yeah. LOX1, they, I mean, they have receptors whose, per, the purpose of the receptor, it's a scavenger receptor. It's actually meant to, ta to bind to things that you you would normally consider a problem in order to deal with it, right? But that's that is already it's already kind of assumed to some degree that endothelial cells should be protected and that they should be kept away from those things that are bad. The problem is is that that may actually be part of how it is that we can dismantle those things that are bad. It's the robust disposal mechanism, you know, the idea that like I mean, it makes sense that we're we're trying to remove things that are bad and that LDL appears to be one of these mechanisms. You know, you have oxidized fats or you have uh, toxins that are being removed. The, the, clearly the body must have a disposal mechanism and it looks like at least some of those go through uh, this pathway. There's a, there's a friend of mine who's an engineer who gave a really, uh, here's an awkward analogy, the awkward analogy of this broadcast. Uh, when I was trying to explain this, he goes, oh, so basically it's like casinos. It's like, uh, what? What are you talking about? He goes, well, you know, if there's like, uh, if there's like a cheater on the floor and they take him and they take him in the back room and then he's not a problem anymore. <laughs> I was like, I don't know if I'd go that far, but <laughs> sure, I guess every casino may have one of those back rooms and not a lot of people look at. Those are, those are the, you know, the uh, extracellular space. Sure, we'll, we'll call it that. Uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting. Uh, that's a, it's a pretty amusing analogy. So, yeah, I think so anyway, the LPS go thing. Oh, go for it. Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to yep. briefly touch on how this relates to the drugs. So if you look at, um, uh, for sepsis patients, they looked at um, PCSK9, and it looked like lower PCSK9 was associated with better survival in sepsis due to increased clearance of lipopolysaccharides. Um, niacin, which lowers LDL and raises HDL and doesn't really have a benefit in uh it does have a benefit in cardiovascular outcomes, but it also has life protein independent effects and inflammation. Uh, statins decrease the expression of toll-like receptors. And if you have certain genetic SNPs for toll-like receptors, it modifies the efficacy of statins with a pretty non-trivial uh, change. One of the questions we'd like to posit is how might you differentiate between statins acting? Because when you, when you look at different lipid lowering therapies and there's not a clear dose response to their action, some of them do absolutely nothing. Some of them do a lot. Well, I would say maybe not a lot, maybe some. Um, how would you differentiate between the possibility that these are pleiotropic effects that are driving the actual benefit versus uh, LDL as a cause? Because there's nothing that guarantees that a pill that 
lowers LDL is that's its main mechanism of action. And we see that with stuff like uh, other drugs that lower the risk of cardiovascular disease, but have nothing to do with lipid lowering, which a great example are SSRIs and SNRIs. If you look at depressed people who take an SSRI who've had a myocardial infarction in the past, uh, all cause mortality is 40% lower uh, in those taking an SSRI and that's lipoprotein independent. So in this sense, um, cause I think a lot of people would pose this question, then why not go ahead and take these drugs as a preventative measure? If they can actually reduce the inflammation in your body, or at least the risk that uh, a disease associated with inflammation is going to be a problem. I think it's important to address the root cause and these drugs are not, um, not harmless. They come with harms um, and, you know, behavioral modification in the case of SSRIs, if you want potentially increased depression, suicidality, uh, statins, you have myopathy and other issues like that. I, I don't think these things are harmless. We don't know the full extent of their effects. Um, and I think it's important to actually address the root cause because these things don't have massive impacts on all-cause mortality in most cases. The system's being messed with. You you don't want to just mess with it more. You know, it's it's clear that we're doing things that are pushing the system outside of its operating region. You know, where where it's comfortable, and you need to fix that problem. And especially since this hypothesis would lead you to an explanation that might be simple and easy to implement. Well, not necessarily easy to implement, but at least there is a solution. Whereas I think that a lot of these other hypotheses don't actually lead you to like. Therefore, you should do X. You know, and that way we have that option and. Conversely, it doesn't really make sense to just start tampering with it more by adding more pokes under the system. It's just not clear what the unintended harm would be, or it's just not how you solve problems. You know? Actually, uh, this, this makes for a good segue since we're talking about problems from within the system. Both of you are what I would deem lean mass hyperresponders, if I'm not mistaken, which is to say your LDL is above 200, your HDL is above 80, and your triglycerides are below 70, and that's likely because you're on a very low carb diet, and I posit because of the energy model, because you're being powered a lot more by direct delivery of fatty acids. Aren't you at least wanting to be a little bit cautious at those levels to maybe consider taking steps to lowering your LDL? Uh, you know, I've, I've thought about it, and I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. I think I'm cautiously optimistic that I'm not going to cause myself <laughs> Uh, which I guess that. I need to trademark that word <laughs> put you in the same, in the same as you yeah um yeah I mean my my LDL my total cholesterol has been as high as 630 uh, my LDL has been directly measured as as high as 505 my LDL particle count blows out the scale I can't do experiments like you because I max out the cardio check yeah it just goes out <laughs> of range <laughs> greater than 400 so like if there's a reason for me to reduce my cholesterol it's so that I can use the bloody cardio check um but yeah, I, I, I hope it's not a problem. And I would like to get more testing done of my vasculature, whether that be a CT, MD, a CT angiogram or something to see um, how my arteries are looking. And the, the, the good news is we have all these imaging tests that are available that can actually answer this question. You know, one of the things that I would, I mean, Nathan has fully doubled my LDL. I'm a little bit ashamed of that, but. Um, <laughs> We can do tests. There's all sorts of imaging tests available and more coming online all the time. And, you know, if, if truly uh, response to retention and high, you know, cumulative exposure are driving atherogenesis, we should be able to take, a, you know, a couple of time series MRIs of Nathan's artery and see ridiculous, fast, freezing progression of atherogenesis. If it's not, I would consider that very interesting observation to informing our hypothesis. But I think, I mean, I'm, I'm not my confidence is high, I'm still going to get CAC tests done and all these things just to double check because you know, uh, it makes sense to apply caution. You know? I'm, not, I'm not trying to be reckless. I'm just trying to be pragmatic. And I, I just- I, I love those answers. Uh, and I'm not gonna miss the opportunity to mention that obviously, as you guys both well know, I'm trying to get a long-term follow-up study on lean mass hyperresponders. I actually think it may be one of the most game-changing studies that could be brought about. Uh, maybe, <laughs> It's, it's fascinating because we've so rarely had the circumstance we have now where both, I'll bet both of you guys have otherwise cardio uh, metabolic markers at the most optimal levels, like absolutely pristine. I've seen so many lean mass type responders, they have low blood pressure, they have not just uh, low triglycerides and high HDL, but they have excellent waist to hip circumference, they have 
excellent uh, fasting glucose. They, I mean, just across the board, they just look amazing. And most importantly, for me at least, they are not hyperinsulinemic. If anything, they're hypoinsulinemic if you want to think that's possible. But I think it's because basically they are in uh, what I consider to be a blended fasted state. I know I've said this before, but I postulate that lean mass hyperresponders are enjoying a higher level of autophagy. Uh, so you have a lot more capability to do a lot more cell maintenance than what we would normally associate with those people that have high levels of cardiovascular disease. So if the lipid hypothesis has legs, I mean, we should be able to see exactly what it was Nick was saying. We should be able to actually observe this progression of atherosclerotic plaque. And of course, I'll, I'll dive in myself. I don't quite hit my own cut points for the lean mass hyperresponder, but I think uh, my very last test, which was a couple of days ago, my LDL clocked in at around 270. Uh, and so at 270, I am at the, I want to say 99.7 percentile of the population. All three of us were at the 99 percentile. And without a doubt, if we were in pretty much any doctor's office around the world, uh, especially anyone that's watching right now, they would say, no, you should be taking serious action right now because you were at a high risk. But yeah, for what you mentioned, Nathan, why I had to laugh, I like to say that I'm cautiously optimistic, not because I think that LDL can't associate with disease. I think that it can. The question is whether or not it's a multifactorial uh, level of which it applies and that there really is one component in which it's associated to being powered by fat. In other words, the metabolic theory that goes behind the lipid energy model that I, I posit, and I think it does, which is why I have the level of optimism I have currently. But my... My opinion will go with the data. They're, they're trying yeah. to argue that LDL is more important than every other possible risk. It, that, that's what kind of boggles my mind. You know, my visceral adipose tissue is down something like 95% since I started this diet. Like you can't try to argue to me that if I have to choose between optimizing for literally everything except LDL and LDL, even if it were some ridiculous pluricausal model with each vector getting a little bit of a, a contribution to the, the problem, it, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't really... I mean, it has to be true. If, what, if it is truly independently associated, we have to see disease, despite the fact that we have absolutely no other risk factors, if that makes sense. Um, and I, I just can't, that seems implausible to me. Well, no, that's, and that's, that's my point, is we don't, we're not looking at people who happen to have low cardiovascular risk markers across the board in an LDL of 130 or 150. You, I'm sure you guys have seen, as I have repeated over and over again, it's dose-dependent, log-linear, it should be that at levels that are comparable to somebody who has homozygous FH. Yeah, I mean, my goodness, uh, in one of the MR studies, an eight milligram per deciliter increase in APOB led to uh, a 40% increase in risk and shit, I'm at, you know, 280. <laughs> 80, 70 million milligrams. fold risk in like, I, I, My <laughs> risk should be like, a, I should be dead tomorrow. Just, I was going to say, we should probably stop this broadcast now so that you can go ahead and just, you know, work your I'm way just, over. Go die. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but in all seriousness, I mean, um, I can't emphasize it enough, and I've done it in the other podcasts. I say cautiously optimistic because that's my way of saying I feel good given the information I have, but I'm not certain. I'm not, uh, you know, on a scale of one to ten, I'm not a zero. I don't know yet, right? But all that said, that's all the more reason why if you yourself believe in the lipid hypothesis, if you do believe uh, all three of us have risk you should be one of the first people to sign up to help us fund this thing, to make it happen, because we would get that data that much sooner. And this is super relevant to everybody, uh, not to be on a soapbox, but clearly a very large portion of the low-carb movement find themselves in the same situation. And the question is, is this truly a net increase in risk? And we won't really know until we get some strong data behind it. Yep, and I'm, I'm signed up for this study with Spencer, and uh, you know I'm going to I pay for tests out of pocket for, uh, you know, CT angiogram, things like that. Um, I've done a CIMT. It was pretty normal. And I'm, so far, so far. So far. Yeah, you never know. We're trying to get him um, to get MRIs of his arteries. We're trying to, like, lure the UW uh, researchers into to testing him by just sending the lipid panel over to them and be like, are you curious? <laughs> that's, act that's actually a really good idea. I didn't <laughs> think about that. All right, well, I think this is a pretty good place to wrap, guys. I'm, I'm really excited about this work you're putting forward, and uh, I really do think we should get some, some testing on this endotoxicity and the possibility, the uh, permeability. I myself, I, I mean it. I'll see if I can add that test um, to at least sporadically to some of my labs to see how it turns out. Yeah, I'm not actually sure if it's a commercially available test. Uh, we're going to have to look. 
Um, we do have a plate reader, so that's. It turns out lab equipment is pretty cheap off eBay if you uh, have one expired needles and things. So they'll, they'll hook you up. <laughs> yeah, expired, expired, but not reused. That's, that's definitely it. not reused. Yep. <laughs> All right, well, thank yeah, you guys, we'll, we'll thank you guys so much. Thank you guys yeah. so much for joining me, and uh, I look forward to seeing how this data turns out. Thank you so much for having us on. Thanks for having us.